Hello, I'm Malcolm Hauslip. On our time, we've chatted to some amazing people, but it's impossible to describe our special guests' remarkable accomplishments. Now, we all remember the days of those iconic Life Be In It cartoon advertisements. Well, although she's not a cartoon advert advertisement, our special <laughs> guest is Darylin Wood. <laughs> And welcome to our time. Do you know, I remember seeing Norm in those Life Be In It ads and at the time thinking, why on earth would you call something Life Be In It? I'm alive and I'm in it. Daryl, and why did you call it Life Be In It? It was something established by um, Brian Dixon in Melbourne back in 1975. <gasps> that and long he, ago. Uh, yes, it was, that I'm afraid. Ago, it was, uh, they came up. But it was really Alex Stitt that came up with the cartoons and, and the characters of Life Binet. And after surveys being done, they realised that Australians needed to be encouraged to get out and do some more activity. Because Norm was a bit fat and the kids were laying about with Norm with the sausages and the tinny, as I he recall. He was a normal man, a, normal, oh, normal person. normal as a normal, normal man. person. And that's why he was called Norm. But you're not a normal person <laughs> because you've had the most incredible life and your involvement in helping the public enjoy their lives more has been just amazing. How did it start for you? Your family, how did your family start? Well, I guess it started when I was a, um, a baby. young baby. Yeah. <laughs> I was born in Southern Cross, which is right. uh, in Western Australia, so I'm really a sand groper, but I hope people here don't We won't that. hold that against no, you. No, that's good. Um, and from there we went to um, uh, Albany and we started on, uh, father got a, a, a what is it, a serv um, soldier, service place so he was we had absolutely all trees we had to go in there and create a farm and amazing he, and we had to build a shed which was half a um, what cutting down the trees and yeah we had to, we had to bulldoze it we had all bulldozers oh, really? and that type of thing and the only machinery we had was an old land rover right and the old and land rover hands, did it I and some hand tools and hand tools. Yeah. <laughs> it was very much like that. It was very much pioneer. We had no electricity, no running water. Um, in fact, we used to have to cart the water if we wanted any water. Oh, um, and that was fine. You know, I was an only child, so I was Dad's right-hand man. I thought that was the best thing in the world. I could do everything and help Dad out. And But by the time I was 12, my parents did separate and my father remarried. And he had a, 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 a the wife who came home with a, another child and I thought, well, I can cope with one. I'm sure this will be fine. But then we found that he, they had four children in orphanages in England and being Dad, who's a wonderful person and um, uh, very kind, actually had them brought out to Australia and oh. came onto the farm. So here we had, going from one person with a little tiny bedroom that was this big <laughs> to um, a shearing shed that we had to change into into. A, accommodation. Right. So he bought these great big doors that came from a garage and they were put on around. We had bag walls, so we had to make bag walls and, and our blankets. I've forgotten bag, bag walls. Bag walls, yes. I remember bag yes. walls as a kid, yes. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And our blankets were Wagga Waggas, which were made out of wheat bags. Yes. And we had some old My army My father beds. had all that, yes. Mm -hmm. I remember seeing that as a grown up, well, as a grown up child. Child can be grown up, and I remember <laughs> seeing the, those sugar bags as yeah. as their blankets. Yeah, yeah. These were wheat bags, and so you know we off, uh, quite oh, often we I got. Said, they probably were sugar bags, but I think we all called them wheat bags, wheat bags. because we didn't know yeah. what they were. Yeah, yeah, wheat bags. They're a bit heavier than sugar right, bags. Yeah, right. that's these right. were quite heavy. I yeah. recall. Yeah. So we'd have condi no no um, lining on the roof, so no. we'd have all condensation coming down and no air conditioning. No air conditioning. We had chooks that laid eggs on yes. the bed and oh, that type gosh. of thing. It was really. A, Really <laughs> down to the limit, and we had to yep. um, we had to survive on the farm. And um, I had a horse, and that was my friend because I had all these other children that I had to look after because they were very busy parents. And because you were the so oldest forth. child, I was the oldest child. Right. And um, they um, she didn't drive, and if father went away, um, I had to go for a special license when I was fifteen. They called it an extraordinary license. So I've got this extraordinary licence and I was also a share How farmer. How long were you driving before that, though? Uh, oh, I started when I was five. Yes, I was going to yes. say, tell the truth here, <laughs> tell the truth. Yeah, I had a, a common ute that Dad used to set the throttle and he'd get on the back with his, <laughs> his wheat and chaff and everything and I, I had to sit on cushions and steer it around and around while he put produce out for the sheep. 
But one day I got bored with that, so I decided to go another way and ran into a fence and I got a hiding. <laughs> <laughs> you see, when you talk about life being it, that's yeah. life being in it. Yeah. That's really it surely living, was. <laughs> yeah, making surely every was. moment of your life yeah. count yeah. to yeah. live. Yep. So my driving continued, of course, over the years and we got a Land Rover, which is fine. And uh, we, we built a hall in Napier. It was called Napier. And there was a lovely hall that um, all the families in the district helped build. And, and we had our um, church services there once a month. And I used to drive there when I was 11, hide the car in the bush so I wouldn't be caught. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, um, I was hoping you'd tell that story. I love that. <laughs> And, the, um, and then again, of course, I thought, well, I've got to do better than this. I just can't have Dad's Land Rover all the time. And, it, you know, so I sold a heifer and bought myself a Ford Prefect car. And driving it home from Bunbury, I bought it in Bunbury actually, driving home, I discovered it had a cracked head, which meant that it needed lots of water to keep it going all right. the way over. So we were stopping at dams and all sorts of things. And so um, we got it home and so I bought another similar car for $10. Ten pound, it would have been ten, ten pound yeah, in those days, yeah. and I used my swing and I, I took the engine out of one and put it in the other, and <laughs> <laughs> the only thing that didn't work was the carburetor because in those days the carburetor was sort of a, a bowl that hung like this with a, a, a bolt through the middle, right? And of course both of them were worn and they'd fall off, so I had all these Vicola jar rings, you know the rings yes, around. Yes, I the do. I used to put that around it, but I had to carry lots with me because the petrol would eat it. And, I'd rotten, it'd fall off. And I'd fire. So there was a lot of um, fun activities well, for that. Well, practicality of life. Mm. The, the, we've lost a lot of that, to be uh, yes. to be frank. You know, yeah. we want to buy yeah. a new thing and chuck away the old. Yeah, no, wouldn't think no, to no, it. you couldn't possibly do that. We, we couldn't do that. Then. So if mm. we just jump forward a bit. So mm -hmm. obviously you went in the professional world in some capacity, which was? Mm. Well, not really. I... I um, Played in a band for a long time, set up a band because we wanted to earn a bit more money and so forth. And but that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. You, you found things to do uh, yes, to earn money. Yes, everything except study. <laughs> and uh, Life is a study. Uh, yes, it is indeed. And it was quite an experience. So we then moved, I then moved into, into Perth and um, I had a phone call from a small school called Penrose Methodist Ladies College. And they said, oh, look, we're looking for a sports teacher. You wouldn't be able to help us out, would you? And I said, but I'm just 18. I'm just the same age as the <laughs> senior students. <laughs> he said, no, no, come in and we'll interview you. And I got the job. And so um, I was their sports teacher. And not only was their sports teacher, I set up a canteen so that they had a canteen at the school. Then I set up a bookshop. I had that. And I was then also looking after kindergarten children right through to... And you were still 18? Things. Yes. And um, I worked there till I was about 20, I think, 21 or something. And I met my husband, who um, uh, I subsequently married, which is wonderful. And um, then I moved to Adelaide and then to Melbourne and so forth. And while I was in Melbourne, I went to a workshop that was called New Games, run by Pat Farrington from America. And it was all about earth balls and parachutes. Okay. So I learnt how to become a life games or a new games instructor. Right. Came back to Adelaide and I looked for a parachute and everything, went to the education department and all sorts of things and finally I found a parachute and I went to the church picnic and I ran all these games. Unbeknownst to me, I was being watched and the education department decided then to employ me to be the teacher for new games in schools and all over the place. So I became then the instructor for, for new games. Were, were, government, were government then starting to worry about um, obesity in children because this absolutely would have, yeah yes, okay absolutely because we had lost doing the things that you'd done because sort of mm. the way that society was moving ahead mm. and mm. Um, well they had a wonderful uh, phys ed program here in South Australia I was right. very impressed with it and uh, and I thought it was the way they had phys ed teachers and all sorts of things yeah. and then they had a gentleman who came in who. I think went through the structure and virtually destroyed it. In my book, he destroyed phys ed in schools, which means to me he actually destroyed the fitness of children and uh, children being able to um, continue their sports. Now they have sports and they play sports, but there was, you know, it's taken a long time for that to come back again. 
Yeah, well, now we've got that sports vouchers that the government is promoting, mm. and fortunately they've gone beyond mm. sports. They've gone mm. to dance and other physical mm. activities. Which is what we want to do, and that's what Life Minute did. We set up a Come and Try program, and the Come and Try program promoted all of these things, and I used to have great arguments because I'd say, now, dance is, is sport. You can still do dance, and that's physical activity. Which is the physical activity, mm. yeah. Yeah, which I used to do. And I even included things like Scrabble. Even though you were sitting down, you were playing with people and you talked. But you're and the, building no, your yeah, life. Yeah, but only that, but they talked. Oh, we should, this is like, we should get out and walk. So right. then it would progress into walking and that type of thing. And, and we, I had a lot of experience with different activities that created this situation for people to get out, get physical, which was good. So life being it started after this though? 75, it yep. started in Melbourne and yep. I came here in about 77, I think. Right. So it so was... So did the t your state of mind and what things were good to do, mm. did that morph with the Life Be In It activities? At Life Be In It was still with the government at that stage. Right. So it was with the state government here in South Australia and it didn't really leave the government here until about 78, um, probably 80, 82. Right. Mm. Well, that's the next page of our story and we'll turn that up to this short break. Welcome back to our time. Our special guest is Darren Wood. Darren, we are just talking about how life be in it really began. We were just saying it began in Melbourne, but you were more or less morphing all that together here in South Australia at the same time. Yes, it was run by the government here in South Australia for some mm. time and then a private company, it went out to another company and I became their, uh, I guess, leader of, of that and my job was to create events for Life Be In It. Um, at the same time, we needed to raise funds for Life Be In It programs so we ran other major events that really were... So the big first one I ever did was called the Colonial Challenge Games and that was run in 12 different country uh, towns around the state. It was in the year of the sesquicentennial. Oh, yes. Yes, and yes. we had everybody dressed up in, in the, the wonderful clothes. I wrote a book so. to go with it, with all the games and everything I wrote else. a book to go with it. Listen here. <laughs> I organised. I wrote a book to go with it. We are in the front runner as well. <laughs> Colonial Games, it's called. And it gave people around the state ideas of what sort of games they could play and how they could dress to to uh, celebrate this particular year. And it's only a little one, it's a sort of manual. And um, so from there we ran these activities. I had a big double-decker bus, a big old London bus, mm -hmm. and all of our staff were dressed in their colonial costumes. I remember and saying that. Do yes. you remember that? Yeah. And we had the most incredible little games that we played um, that were old-fashioned games at, that they had. And every, in every town we had to have competition and the winner of that then was brought down to Adelaide at the end and the, and the big finale and we had a competition at the finale. So it was a very big event and it, um, but it was very colourful and it was wonderful to see these people diving through windows or um, <laughs> all sorts of equipment that we set up that looked old fashioned and um, it was a great event. So that was, that was the big event that we ran then but at the same time I was running and expanding the Come and Try program which um, the Office for Recreation and Sport funded for many years to help develop various sports and that went into disability. So it's right. come and try disability. Do, do you think with the development of our society, do you think um, so much emphasis is, is has been put on having things mm. but not necessarily doing things? I, th I think we is, lack... Is that a way to express it? Yes, it's a good way, but it, it's also we need to have grassroot level type activity so that right. that can build up. And you need to be able. You need to, a beginning point. You need a beginning point, right. and we do yep. lack that. I feel, and uh, a lot of Still, the sports. Yes, you don't I think, think so. we've learned from history. No, no. <laughs> no. I'm getting old. <laughs> no, 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 no. But you know, there is. I'm on this a lot. There's a lot of danger with people who don't want to know what the past is, mm. and we repeat the same mistakes if we don't understand what the past is. Unfortunately, I have seen that happen so many times, mm. and people come in and they say, "We're going to run it this way," and I think quietly to myself, yes, I ran that 35 years ago in exactly the same way. Yep. And they, and it's like a big circle. Yep. And you, you don't well, knock yeah. anything like that because it's helping to develop Of course. The, but uh, what you activity. really want to see are things mm. expand and, and yeah. become even more attractive to the people that you're trying to yeah. deal we, with. We really need to have 
um, activities that people can enjoy without the bells and whistles, without the big yeah, television stuff. programs, without the um, big shows. The whole, you know, well, you know, they have. You, you absolutely brought up a mm. point there that's very mm. valid. Mm. Sitting at home watching somebody go through those adventures in life, if you mm. like, is not exactly healthy for you because you're sitting on your backside mm. and watching this stuff and doing mm. nothing about mm. it. Mm. It's like the cooking programs. It's like it's lovely to see all these wonderful dishes being created. Yes. And you think you've, I mean, because the eye sees it and almost you think you've tasted it yourself with them saying, isn't it lovely <laughs> yes. and it's this, that and that or it's awful. Yeah. But the reality is you're not eating proper food at the time. You're probably eating a bit of rubbish <laughs> at the time, some takeaway. Yeah. It's very hard. I mean, the... A lot of people now are walking, which is great to see. Definitely a lot of people a big walking thing back and on that, yes. cycling has become quite popular. So it's education yeah. though, isn't it? Absolutely. So life being it was a combination of education and activity mm. together. Mm. Mm. We did try to do a lot of that. And of course our life games or new games as it was, we wanted to promote the fun of it rather than being serious about running an event and winning. We wanted to run these wonderful for the fun. Yeah, for the fun. The parachutes and the earth balls and the stilts and the geeters and all that type of thing. You, do you think fun. in our society it's all become, uh, probably because of the television program, somebody has to win and it's money at the end. Mm. Do you think we've lost that joy of just participating? In some ways it can happen and it depends on, um, I guess, society itself and how they perceive um, the way they should be conducting their lives. And you have that group of people who are reasonably fit because they go out and they keep fit. They go to the gym or they walk or they run. Then you have that group of people who mm, might do it today or might, might not. Yeah. And then you have the group of people who are the ones that sit at home watching everything yeah. on yeah. telly without doing anything. But if, I mean, the, the sports people and the champions at sport are very important because a lot of uh, children and people aspire to them and want to do that sort of thing so they get out and they, they become active. So it, it's yeah, got to fit just going in, to say in that. all ways. I guess, yeah, I guess those programs, to be fair, do inspire people mm. to, to go out and try mm. things, mm. but maybe they don't inspire them enough in the sense of participating. It's mm. more about the winning mm. and watching mm. the tennis or watching the football or watching the whatever. It is Everything is geared about winning, not participating. Mm. 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 And heroism. Yes, Heroism. very much so. And very so much. really what we want to try and do is get people out there to enjoy their lives, get a bit fitter doing it, um, encourage their children to join them. Right, and be the hero in their own community. Mm. Mm. I, I always guess. say, you know, take your dog for a walk, but it's not. It's the dog takes you for a walk. Right. But that's not all you've done. Oh, no, actually. When I was looking, when I was Googling you, as one does, mm. um, there's been so many other things you've organised. So would you call yourself an event coordinator? Yes. So just explain what an event coordinator's job actually is. Well, you're provided with an event or you have an event that you've managed to get and you then run that event. So we did the Tourism Awards, South Australian Tourism Awards for four years. We did um, the World BMX Championships and the State Championships for quite a few years. Mm -hmm. um, and that was very exciting because there was all sorts of things with that one. Um, we did the Killboat Triathlon. We do um, Corporate Cup, of course, which is a, a has been going now for 40 years. Mm -hmm. and I've been involved for 40 it's years. quite a bit about you there and, and what mm. you've organised. Mm -hmm. And it's not just me. I, I, that's why I always... I always believe that even if you have um, staff, you have students, particularly students who come to do their work experience with us, mm. um, we love to make sure that all those people are included in the event management of these things. So, Well, that's um, how the new generation is going yeah, to learn. Yeah, well, that's how they learn and, and that's why it's so important to, it's not just me organising an event, it's me and no, all of these other people. Everybody needs sort of a leader in this situation with <laughs> yes. experience yes. to know how to direct people to yeah, yeah. do their job. Yeah. And that is you. Well, we had some exciting things like the opening of the tunnel ball, the Heisen Tunnels. Now, there's a good one. Talk about that for a minute. <laughs> okay. Maybe because living here in South Australia, um, for the people in Victoria, we never had any tunnels here at all. and We've got big hills sort of mm. surrounding mm. the city. Mm. And consequently, we needed a way rather than winding backwards and forwards around the hills like this to mm. get from the plains to the top. Mm. Um, they cut a couple of tunnels. They and did. Then, they had to open them. And the opening was? 
Well, it was it was called the Time Tunnel Ball, and it was to raise funds for charity. Three charities were involved, and my job as event manager was to make sure the event went on. And of course, the charities were there um, and everything else. But it was a blank canvas. We had this tunnel and it was still a construction site so everything we did we it was construction we had to wear the hats we had to wear the vests and everything else so the Fashion whole went thing out the window whole thing was designed around that so the the um, all of the um, waiters and everything were dressed as construction people yeah. and we had um, tables but the exciting part about the whole thing is you know it's got a six degree yes. lean on the road all the tables had six degree lean and so everybody's drinks were like this. Yes. And But when you have a stage, Malcolm, and you know this, the stage has got to be level. Yes, so I they'd do. all wander up with their drinks and they'd put it on here and they couldn't work it out. So we had to have a room in the other tunnel that was the first aid room for all the people that were getting seasick. <laughs> so... <laughs> oh, we had what's going with, on? What's <laughs> going on? <laughs> they couldn't work it out. And it was cold and, we, and I made sure I told everybody on tickets everywhere, please bring warm clothes. But no, you know it's like we didn't have ball. A, a ball. ball. That's right. And even though I had eight shipping containers positioned at the top to help keep out the breeze, it still happened. And it means that... It's a taking, tunnel. I know. <laughs> they're taking everything off the chairs, Malcolm, and putting them over themselves. <laughs> And they were going off with their, their, the wrappers that were around the chairs. And we had to have a security guard out the front to take it out of their bags as they were leaving. Oh, <laughs> so gosh. These are, these are things people don't know. You know, <laughs> it's the background stuff. Mm, mm. And we're going to tell you some more background stuff with this lovely lady, Darren Wood, after this short break. <laughs> we're talking about the wonderful life of Daryl and Wood. Daryl and... All of these uh, executive positions you've been in, leadership positions you've been in, what are you doing now? Well, I have retired actually, Malcolm, or sort of retired. And um, Sort of retired. My, <laughs> my, my job really is to, I'm on the board still of Life Binet, but I'm also a volunteer, an active volunteer with them. And so instead of organising the Corporate Cup now, but a wonderful team of people who do that, I'm the one that stands at the gate and directs the traffic or something similar, which is a very important position because you get to talk to people. It, it, yes. You're dead right. Yeah. Everything is an important position as a volunteer, mm. though, when you think mm. about it. We have wonderful volunteers. And yeah. being the volunteer, the camaraderie is still there. Mm. Mm. And you don't have so much of the responsibility. You can enjoy it a little bit more. Yes. Yeah, no, that's what do you right. want to do when you grow up? Um, keep doing what I'm doing. I'm having fun That's the doing right it. answer. Absolutely. Because yeah. one of the most important things in life is to be in it, as the mm. saying goes. Mm. And for those of us that have sort of left the jobs, although I still haven't left the job, but for those who have left the jobs, um, what do you do? Sit at home and watch the wallpaper go mouldy, really? No. Get out no. and enjoy life no. by volunteering for things. Mm. And it can take you to so many different places. Oh, it does. It's wonderful. And we have some wonderful volunteers. Uh, uh, you know, Mother's Day, the Mother's Day Classic that we run as well yes. here in Adelaide. Um, wonderful volunteers there. I mean, the, the City Bay Fun Run when I was running that had 1,000. How many years did you do that? Uh, 12 years, I think. Right. Yeah. Did you uh, ever run in it yourself? You didn't have don't time. Don't tell anyone, Malcolm. I never ran in anything. Because <laughs> you never had time. No. I suspect. <laughs> you know, it's lovely talking to you because... It just gives everybody watching, I think, the impetus to say, I must get up and do something about my life. Yes. If I haven't, if I feel like it's over or I need to get up and volunteer, just have a go. It truly is the best thing. Mm. It truly is. It's very satisfying. And what you can be a child and need to be active, but you can be an adult and an older adult and need to be just as active. We just have to be a bit more careful. This has been great to have your company and your company on this episode of Ad Time. So until we see you next, keep yourself nice till then. Bye.
Next time on Our Time, we're talking with Greg Mackey, who's the CEO of the History Trust here in South Australia, about... About the History Trust grant programs, about the History Trust's South Australian History Festival that runs for the entire month of May, about the Adelaide Festival of Ideas, which will be coming back in July, and about the Cabaret Fringe, uh, which will be presented in June. And we're talking about a whole lot more. All we need is you.